Are you okay with some, with that other spouse putting some money to the side, not to to bust a move, but it's just like you know what? I know Leroy ain't gonna. He's not. He's not gonna get on board with the budget. Right. Leroy okay. gonna spend the money on Jordan, so I'm gonna put up some money. What's up, Brave Arts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of the Scary Theory Mary wanting you to love fearlessly. Brave Hearts community, this episode I'm so excited about because once I found this young lady on social media, I said, this is who I need. <laughs> you are in for a treat. Today's special guest is Shonda DeShield. How are you doing this evening? I am well. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited. <laughs> yes, for sure. I don't want to waste any of your time. I want to jump into today's segment because I want to talk about what you do. And I want to know what inspired you to become a divorce financial coach. I love that. Can you expound oh, on that? Yes, I can. Um, well, as we know, most marriages fell one way or another. And the biggest reason is because of the money gripe, besides of infidelity and things of that nature. But no matter which way or why your divorce happened or occurred, there's always the lingering money issue. Most times people like to put the money to the back of the marriage um, and deal with it later. And I help divorced people eliminate debt and that's a big deal to me. It's a simple sentence, but it encompasses so much more. And I needed to do that because starting over, I went from two incomes to one income and I had to pull myself together right away. And I know that if I had to do it, a lot of other people had to do it too. So I went into that arena. I have, I have a heart, a passion for it. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about your story? Because I know I was watching some of your your uh, YouTube reels and you talked about, like you said, going to the one income or I think you were maybe a stay at home mom and yes. trying to get your finances. Uh, yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, I was working and he was very generous. So he told me I could actually come home. So that's how. I, I, left, I walked away from the income, came home. I was a stay-at-home mom. Things were deteriorating, which is so wild because we saw it going a whole different way. <laughs> but um, things started deteriorating and I needed to go on my own. And I just started to plan out my moves um, before any major big announcement. I, I knew the direction it was going and I started to literally fine tune comb all of our finances, hold all the bank statements. I don't know how I had my wits about me because a lot of people don't do it, but I knew that that was going to be a major issue. And so I needed to see what it took to take care of that home and try to plot and plan is what I say, what my life would be like afterwards. I didn't want to give up a lot, but I knew I was going to have to give up something. And so, um, that's, that that took me to the next trajectory of looking for employment to make sure that I can take care of myself, myself and my son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, and I'm, I'm glad that you actually do this. So those who are watching, those who are listening, make sure, and I want to make sure you give out your information as well at the end of the show, sure. because I believe there's a lot of people, because I get inboxes sometimes where people are going through a divorce, but rarely do they talk about the finance piece. Yeah, it's the most complicated part, I think. I mean, you deal with the heart part, and that is a constant battle. So nobody really wants to take in, leap from the heart to the money, because then you know you're really going to go dig deeper with more angst and anxiety and frustration and anger and resentment. And in fact, don't we take most things, most of us take most things out when the finances is anything. Anyway, um, the movie Harry Met Sally is coming to mind, and I'm thinking how he says things you don't even care about. You didn't even care about that red sofa, but now the divorce is here. It's like, I want you to sell it and give me my half or I'm taking the red sofa with me. And it's like mm -hmm. everything that meant nothing means something financially in the end. Because in the end, we really realize that your household is a business. 
And when you partner up with your spouse, you have to look at the heart and the extended measures of the heart. Um, and that's looking at the family, the nucleus of it. So how do we look at that? We look at it traditionally through the money, you know, your health care, you, you, you know, you, from your automobile to your home to the estate the, thereafter, what happens with your children, you know? So the money is a very tough situation. And I would like it if most of us would talk about it more, but most, a lot of people, even within their marriages, one person is the stronger person and the other person just relies on that person to handle it. Yeah. And that's interesting. You say that I want to ask you this. I think I asked this question on social media the other day. Can two, like people have different money languages. Uh, can two like spenders, can they, can the, can that relationship survive or like two savers? Can that work? I think, I think all marriages can work, Okay. especially if you sit down and talk about it. everybody always say the number one thing we need to do is communicate. So I think if you have two spenders, you're still going to have one that spends more than the other. That just is that's always going to be the case. And the person that spends more um, is going to see the other person is thrifty, right? Because mm -hmm. you really, those two are not going to be like, we're both over here just doing it. Somebody thinks I spend less than this person. This person's going above and beyond. And so, yeah, I think it can work. But I think we have to always fine tune comb it by coming up with a plan, by sitting down with our money. I think I talk about, you know, financial date nights where you actually open up the dialogue to say once a month or twice a month, we're going to sit down and look over the books. And for the person that is most uncomfortable with it, it's like I can print out a an overview, a statement for you to see the big picture of what's going on in our family. Because the more that you do run the finances like a business, the better it will be for you, no matter what way this goes, you know, um, because the legacy, you're going to be handing things over to your children and you need to see how that estate is set up and you need to have that estate set up for yourselves because you never know what can happen. That's true. Yeah, because... Life happens to all of us. No one is immune. No one. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember going through my divorce and we had some financial issues. And I remember separ separating and started to do the finances on my own. And I was thinking, I was like, I haven't done this in years. Wow. Just doing the facts. I think I seen one of your uh, YouTube reels where you talked about doing the finances on your own, opposed to when you had that partner when you were married. Right. And it just took me back to that time when I remember sitting at my kitchen table, going through my divorce, and I'm like, wow. But the bills, they seemed a lot easier, too, because it was just me. <laughs> it was just you. But then you still had to figure out those due dates. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And you still had to figure out, like, how much is coming in, how much is going out, and can I still have the things that I so enjoy in my life? In fact, I would say most people after divorce when they experience life even grander than they did with inside the confines of the marriage. So you really want to start figuring out what you can let go of so you can really indulge in the things that will bring brightness and joy to your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, so I say in, in both, you know, I'm remarried. So in both my marriages, um, I maintain taking care of the household bills and the funds and looking over the financial statements and trying to sway my partner to to get on board with the plan that I have um for us and it, it's not an easy thing it's not easy and I'm we're not perfect I mean I still work on talking to my husband my current husband um to get on board with the direction that we're trying to take for our financial plan to get the things we both say we want um and so like after divorce, I really want women and men. I talked to, at first I was just talking to uh, the women, but men need this help too. Because some cases the men are running all the monies of the household. And in some cases, just like myself, it's the women. And like you said, when you're on your own and that other person isn't there, it's like taking a test and you know, the teachers at the front, you wanna ask that question and you had the ability 
but now you don't, you know, now it's like, really, like, I, this is the SAT, I'm sitting here, and I can't ask anybody but me, I gotta go on my own strength, and it's hard, and it's not as simple as we'd like to make it, and a lot of times, we just pick, make the minimum payment and push everything to the side, we don't really handle it, we just, um, I, I just felt like we band-aid it. You know, we put a band-aid on it. We pay the minimum pay payment. We save. We can keep going. The credit card, you know, spending is still occurring. We have no way of knowing about it because we're not really pulling the record. And I really want to stop that from, from happening, which is why I'm saying, let's get a handle on your finances. Let's really look at the big picture. Let's get some of the basic principles out the way so you feel comfortable and confident about the direction you're taking. And you can spend with ease. You can spend with ease when you do have a plan. I mean, of course, you spend with ease when you don't, but you have that that anxiety that comes up later when you really have to face it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. like, keep me on board. Like, is this the direction you want to go in so that I know I'm, I'm steering in the direction you want? No, for sure. I mean, I, I love this conversation because like I say, this is much needed and we don't we don't have enough people, especially people of of our color. Right. Having these conversations about divorce and finances. Thank you, because money isn't always sexy. It's sexy when you're spending it, but <laughs> when you have to reel it in, it's not sexy. And so I try to do it with a way to help people want to listen, even for a moment. Um, to just grab a nugget, you know, grab a nugget and put into action. I'm always saying, let's take an action. I do that all the time on my Instagram. It's like, hey, this is it. Let's go take an action. You know, let's just go ahead and call the insurance company and just see what the rates are. You know, mm -hmm. let's just take an action because that's what money is about, too. It's about like those little action steps, except those little steps are magnanimous. They're huge. You know, um, my husband and I, in, in my second marriage, we just had the insurance person out at the kitchen table. I mean, you don't have to have them at your kitchen table. The way our society is, you can just do it online. But it meant so much to us. We both were sitting there, cringed up, gasping for air and talking about things we don't really want to talk about, but we also want to make sure we have in place. And so it's about doing what's hard and we all can do hard things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because um, I believe, well, let me know what you think, because this is about you today. <laughs> what do you think about people who have one person who handles the finances and it's not like a team effort? It's just one person that's handling the finances. How do you feel about that? I'm neutral because like I really believe in marriage and I the sanctity of it. And um, like I said, I'm I'm not averse to that. I'm always encouraging um my husband to get on board with it more so like me, but I, I realized that it's not everybody's forte mm -hmm. and it's not like like I said, it's not the sexiest. So I recommend doing that analysis where they have the big picture and you show it to them. And then you have these money conversations, a date night, or, or, you know, some people pick Sunday or Monday, whatever your time is. And you just, I, I say like, we like do icebreaker talk. So we don't go too hard where it mm -hmm. spirals out of control. So it's kind of like, let's table this. But for now, we're just going to talk about this one topic and then I'll go good. We just got in, we're getting right on out mm -hmm. um, to slowly rope that partner into talking about money and feeling more comfortable with the direction you both decided on mm -hmm. and it, it make it just more easier for them to digest you know so sometimes if we just throw it on real fast it's like overwhelming and it starts an argument and most times the argument is more so because the other person is confused about like what like <laughs> I, i'm not thinking about it that deep you're over analyzing it you're like no well not really so i just believe just give a little nugget Mm -hmm. And like have set times where we say, okay, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes just talking about money. And then we're going to come right out of the conversation until that person is more comfortable with the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. That's how I, that's how I handle it. And that's how I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree because like you say, it's a team effort. I think it's important that you both be involved, but I do know some married couples that there's one person they like, look, I handle the finances. 
and the other person because it can become uncomfortable they they don't they don't get involved they're like you got it cool but mm -hmm. i have heard of stories where a spouse dies yeah. and you haven't paid a bill in 20 years right you know you just know everything is set up for you but exactly. that can also kind of cripple that person as well. Yes, it, you know. it backfires on that person. I mean, in my first marriage, I, like I said, I handled the bulk of it. Mm. And I always give the analogy that I think he had like 30, 25 to $30,000 in um, college debt. And I, we put it in forbearance. And if it were up to him, he would just sit on it and just wait until the letters come. Um, but I just, started paying, making major payments and doubling up those payments and then tripling up those payments. What I can say is by the time I left, I had it down between five and $10,000 mm -hmm. and I felt good about it for him, uh, for myself to be able to do it. But for him to know that, you know, you leave them better than you found them. So to say, nobody expected us to walk away from each other, yeah. but at least I knew with the goodness of my heart that money shouldn't have been a thing that he couldn't pick up on because I tried to drop down all the, the heavy hitters. Now, that's in the confines of marriage and you have to know who you marry. You you just, hopefully the person who's giving the other person power believes in their heart that person has their best interest and is doing that. You know, um, closing up the gaps to make the, sim the this most simplest process possible with the budget so that if the other person ever needs to pick up the pieces, it's easily laid out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I say have those meetings. Even if you don't want anything to do with it, you can have a nice um, binder. I like binders. They're not set up right now. But a binder with every month of where you stand, mm -hmm. just like an emergency, break this, you know, break this glass mm -hmm. and go here. Mm -hmm. This will give you the basics. And I, I, we talk about that. I talk about that with my husband now, like, we need a spot for just the passwords, you know, we need a spot for just those annual statements so that if you ever do need it, if ever someone's sick or hurt or anything, you can go there and pick up the pieces. So I do recommend that. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you're talking about it because it's making me say, okay, do more on that topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, and I'm using this as a, as a scenario because I, I think was it Jumping the Broom, the T.D. Jakes movie, I think? Mm -hmm. And I think they lost everything or whatever, but the wife had some money. She had like 10 racks put up. She had like <laughs> $10,000, but the husband didn't know. Okay. Did, did you see that movie? I'm sure I did, but that's, this part is not coming. I mean, what, what happened with the money? What, what she ended up doing? Uh, I think they, and I could be wrong. In the comment section, if you've seen the movie, uh, <laughs> yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about. Give me a quick breakdown. If, if I'm wrong, correct me. So uh, help me, Lord. But anyway, the I think they had a bad uh, business investment or something like that, I think. And they were about to lose everything. But then the wife, she had like $10,000 put up to the side, like an emergency. But he didn't know. Right. So he was like, oh, my God, like, you know, you're an angel. So I'm thinking, how do you feel about that? Because what if someone, what if you're married to someone who's a spender? Right. Uh, and this wasn't in my notes. This just came to me. Mm -hmm. and, and they're a spender. Are you okay with some, with that other spouse putting some money to the side? Not to, to bust a move, but it's just like, you know what? I know Leroy ain't going to, he's not, he's not going to get on board with the budget. Right. Leroy okay. going to spend the money on Jordan. So. I'm going to put up some money. I'm okay with it. That's me. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold the ground on that um, mm -hmm. because that's kind of like what it takes, right? That's what it takes to, to be in a marriage. That the person who is in charge of the finance to put money over for an emergency fund, um, to put shelter money over, you know, because you like this happened. You are all, that person should always be planning for the rainy day fund. And so I definitely recommend, I always recommend it. You know, he has her, his account, she has her account. There's the collective of the bills. And then there's this side money where you are saving for a specific thing, you know, like, like you're saying, like if an emergency crack this one and you're making it um, a, a area where it's high interest bearing, but it's untouchable, so to say, like it takes two signatures. You can set that up too. 
where here's this when he take two signatures or it takes evidence of the other person being disabled or unable to sign. I'm good with that. I think that's a part of a great marriage, you know, mm -hmm. just like a great business is always going to make sure like it's got its ducks lined up. Now, when it starts out, it's going to be rough, but as it grows, it establishes that right up front. Mm -hmm. You know, that's good. Yeah. Now I hate this. This is this is good. I'm really enjoying this. What is what is the biggest mistake you see that women make in marriage or in relationships? Now, why'd you put, why'd you single out the women versus the men? Just so I can get the backstory on that. Because, because when I, when I interview men, I ask men, I say, what is the okay. biggest mistake you see men make in relationships or in okay. marriage? Yeah. So when it's women, I ask the women. Yeah. What so is the biggest I'm, mistake? I'm an equal opportunity employer. I, <laughs> okay. I talk okay. to men. Yeah. This, this isn't one of those crazy shows where it's just downplaying women or men. If I, anybody can get it on this show. Okay. So you say in marriage. Okay. So. Well, I'm just going to tell you what I think, and it's yeah. it's kind of slightly before marriage, and it lingers in a lot of marriages, and I hear it in a lot of divorce stories. Women marry for potential. Most women marry for potential. Something about the nature of womanhood, of caring, and always being able to feel like we can fix something, we can heal something, we can care for something. We'll see this man... And we will see things that he don't even see in himself. And um, most women, a lot of women, let me just say a lot, so that everybody don't backfire on me, or if you want to, that's fine. They say, one day I think he could be this, or one day I see him moving this way. If he keeps in this direction, he should go there. And these are her thoughts on him. So I just say, that's one. That's what I think is the number one mistake that most women make. The second thing is not really understanding the way that man communicates. And then there you'll have him feeling like she's withholding information or she's nagging. So she's either overdoing it one and or another and not learning how to communicate with him. Um, Steve Harvey always says, you know, men are not going to get that deep into that portion you know our love is not expressed like that so it's like find out a way to let them know like i need to communicate with you this is a sense of urgency i'm using strong language so i don't have to nag do you hear me and i think <laughs> I, for me that is what i learned to do i wasn't always there so i would say that's a communication tactic so the first is um I don't know, like the first is you putting yourself on someone else trying to idealize what they will be. And the second is not communicating in a way that you can be heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know I was on a struggle bus big time with that. Uh, sometimes I just have issues with communicating how I truly feel. But what I do is I've learned over the years is. Uh, to use my wheel of emotions. Have you ever seen that? They have a wheel of emotions. Yes, yes. But tell me yeah. how you use it. How do you use it for you? I literally have to stop myself because my wife and I be talking because, you know, she she be talking. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay. And she be like, well, tell me how you feel. Or I don't understand what you're saying. So what I do is I just take a second to stop. And then I try to dig deeper opposed to me saying, I feel sad. I'll say... I feel alone when, oh, or wow. uh, I I feel that I'm I'm lonely in this area of of life, or you know, mm -hmm. what I'm saying just to try to give more detail opposed to just me saying I'm sad or I'm mad. It's like, yeah, I have to think to myself, if I'm mad, mad about what, right? And then I just try to dig deeper than saying mad. So then I might just break down and say, you know what? I feel vulnerable in this area. Oh, you are progressive. Yeah. So so the wheel start to to turn in my wife's head, you know. So and, and and I miss it a lot of times because we're just in the middle of a conversation. But then I have to catch myself and say, okay, I feel vulnerable. So instead of me saying I'm mad, I'll say I feel vulnerable. Now she starts to say, what can I do to help opposed to being defensive? 
Oh, was this a first marriage or a second marriage? <laughs> oh no, this second marriage. Uh, th this is this marriage. No, that that didn't happen in my first marriage. My first marriage, I was young. I was a mess. I was defensive. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, but that was something that I had to learn over the years, and I still have not perfected it. I'm not mm -hmm. all the way there yet, but I am a lot better because my wife will tell me I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. Oh, I that, love that. Yeah, and that starts to open the door for us to have a deeper conversation. Or I realize too that sometimes conversations are better better during pillow talk when the kids are asleep. When your stomach is full, you're not sleepy, sleepy, but you're relaxed. Right. Um, and there isn't a lot of tension going on. Right. So if you can have pillow talk, uh, I, I believe that's when my wife and I have the best conversations in pillow talk or when we're reading a book together. When we're reading a book together, those are some of our best conversations. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So... I absolutely love that, like you said, for for men and women, but definitely for men to give you that extra nugget. Because, you know, even my husband, he might send me a one-liner text. <laughs> and I used to be frustrated. But um, now I just stop and read it slow. And I've been like, okay, this means a lot. This one sentence here, let me grab this. Because this is, you know... Um, but I had to give myself permission not to get frustrated and to to flow with the, you know, to flow with his style of communication mm -hmm. and realize like when he does write five sentences, like, oh, something's is heavy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like like you're saying, this was a second marriage type of um, epiphany to uh, be more respectful of that person and calm down i do love that whole pillow talk thing we do that too i never even think about it like it until you said it um besides the scheduling of times i love those moments too when it's just like a sunday morning and no one has to work and we can just lay in and get you know get some relaxed talk because then it's not coming off like you said so defensive and rough it's like hey i don't know if you noticed this it's like, oh, really? You know, I love those moments. Mm -hmm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then sometimes they come in therapy, too. You know, you have conversations because you have that third party there because uh, we have our, our marriage therapist and stuff like that. But I think it's when you have those moments of pillow talk and when when the emotions aren't running high or when there's a thousand and one things going on at once, because I realized the biggest time my wife and I miscommunicate is when we're talking and passing. It's like okay. we have a bunch of things going on. You know, I got one of the kids. She got two of them. She's trying to cook dinner. I'm on my way home. It, it, you know, and hold on, babe. Wait a minute. Somebody's calling. Hold on one second. And right. Kind of, you know what I'm saying? And you I miss it. Yeah. I like, and that's why I think the pillow talk is great. Uh, because after we finish recording, it's going to be time for pillow time for pillow talk time. Amen, amen. <laughs> you know, so. You're going to have me talking too because... <laughs> You know, you're saying things that I actually go through, but I never, um, I never segmented. So to be like, oh, he's, a, I will say something. He'll say something like, oh, I mentioned this to you, but you were obviously not paying me any of mine. It's like, oh, that's like hitting hard. Like, no, I want a piece of mine. And then I'm thinking about what you're saying. Wow, this was happening. This was happening. And something did get past me. So we have to like intentionally, willfully set up these measures with this pillow talk to yes. forgive each other for those times and like bring it all in, tie it all together. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like you, I've been in that area because I'm always so busy trying to work and then get this business to like, you know, 360 to a level where it's doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always kind of like preoccupied in my thoughts and I have to catch myself like, whoa, say mm -hmm. it again. Mm -hmm. Let me Let me get my mind all the way on here. Um, you turn in this all the way into like this is us, what you do. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. Yes. If I could get him, I mean, he did say he was open to going to therapy, but at one point he was totally against it, saying that if people have to go to therapy, then you know, like it's already wrong. And it's like, no. Um, so some people do think like that, and 
So I don't know what happened, but he was like, okay, if you want to go to a therapy session, I'm open to it. So that, that's a yummy concept right there to actually get to that point. Yes. If you, yes. Uh, I have one piece of advice I can give to women because contrary to popular belief, most of my, my, my clients are men. Okay. You know, so I hear their hearts and if there's any piece of advice I can give to women concerning uh, communication as far as listening to him is giving him your undivided attention um, and, and put put the femininity on him, like rub the hand or, you know, just hand on the thigh or hand on the back or if you like his head rub, just kind of and be inquisitive because we want to think that we got it all figured out. <laughs> you know, yeah. but putting that feminine piece on and you kind of just put your hand on, on, you know, on, on your face and you're like, so how can I, how can I help you? Like, it's, it's like, I want to hear you and how can I help you? And mm. that's when he starts to, when he starts to melt, he starts to really tell you how he feel. Cause now he feels safe. Right. But when you when you come in to him like, why didn't you do this? And then and then that's when that's when he just shuts down. You're gonna right. lose him. You know, you gotta have that safe environment for him. And I know it won't always be like that, but I think if you sow more good seeds than than bad seeds, he's he's more likely to hear you and he won't think you're nagging. Because sometimes I get from women, there's, you know, he he says I'm nagging, and my thing is to her is, do you, do you make more deposits or or do you make more withdrawals mm-hmm. in your relationship? Since we're talking about money, you know, I thought I would use that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but good, are you making, good. yeah, are you making more emotional deposits or or emotional withdrawals? Are you always telling him what he's not doing opposed to telling him what he is doing? Um, my wife will she would write me little sticky notes sometimes. Oh, and, that's nice. Yeah, and I, and I, I, I still have them because they. Yeah, make I love food. that. Yeah. I, well, the second marriage did that for me in the way that there's a level of reverence and respect I have. So, hold on, let me fix it. So because of that, I hope you can still help me. Hold on. There's a level of respect that I have. So because of that. I don't just come at him any old kind of way. <laughs> I just won't. Yeah. Like never. Um, I always take a pause. I always take a pause. Because I married an older man, uh, my second go around. And that level of respect is there just in general. Um, so I want I guess I, I guess for my younger self, I married someone that it was easier for me to just nag away at. I don't know if it was, you know what I mean? Like I just didn't have that same reverence of respect for the person, but also for the situation. Like, you know what? I've been here before and I don't want to spiral in the wrong direction. So I'm open to learning. So I never, um, I never just go at it the way I used to. Like I never just, no, 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 no. I never, never. Um, so I don't want to say it's unheard of. I'm sure there are many marriages practicing that. But just like you, I would just say the one thing I know that I, is a gift that you can give a man that I believe is respect. And especially if you fall in love with somebody, you admire your respect on that level. And um, that respect comes with the pause from the rip. Like, it's like, how can I, it's always, how can I present this in a package that um, he can receive easiest? And if I see that I said something that wasn't well received, I'll say, please forgive me. Um, I, I need you to take a second ear and hear this out. And that that's my way of saying this is a strong language message. Um, because I feel also uh, oftentimes in marriages, sometimes we we can miss it. Like you say, we can miss the message from all the other nuances in our life. And you don't even intentionally mean it, but down the road that spirals you to believe that that person don't care about anything you say. You're not seen, you're not heard, you're disrespected. So um, I always preference now to show that sign of respect and 
yeah, I don't think I'm going to lose that. But I want to, I want to tie it back up to the money, to the fact that like, I'm getting him to also respect the finances that come in our house from him and myself. Uh, because being, though it's a second marriage, the money didn't fall into the pot the way the first marriage did. See, the first marriage, the pot was hand over the checks. I'm going to just, we're going to get this done. Let me give you your portion after everything. And the second marriage was like, no, uh, well, we both come from marriages. So it's like, mm -mm. It, it's a lot tighter when it comes to talking about money because we both know what it was like to have to fall to nothing and come back up again, rise from the ashes. So it's like, okay, here's your money. Here's my money. Now we need to grow this pot over here for the us. And so in my marriage now, we practice growing that middle pot um, to do the things that I talk to you about, more emergency funds. Um, you know, we want to take the trip, whatever that is. It, it's not the same. And I really do. I don't know. Like, I would love to hear even more about that. Like that second marriage, you're not handling the money like you did the first marriage because now you've been, you know, you really had an eye opening awakening of how valuable that money is. Can you let your heart open up to expose yourself in that manner again? You mm -hmm. know, what does that look like? I would submit to you that a lot of second marriages, their money story is totally different than the first marriage. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm a witness. <laughs> our, 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 our finances is way better than the first time around. Amen. Um, and I think I think a lot of it just came from uh, hard work, commitment, and having a goal. We wanted to buy a house this year. That's what we did. Uh, we wanted a brand new car, got a brand new car, you know, all last year in 2022. Right. <laughs> but, you know, we, we saved for it and saved the amount of money I've, I've never saved in my whole life, you know, but we had a goal. And now that we have those things now we got to start back with a new plan because now we got to replenish that because we bought a new house and a new car but we know what it takes to get there right because we've done it so you guys came up with a house plan or whatever that plan was and you just went at it and attacked it yep that is beautiful yeah every you know bonus or any extra money or all that stuff we just just saved it. Just put it in, like you say, a high savings, you uh, high you savings uh -huh. account. Mm -hmm. Put it in there and just save it. And uh, even with our like our life insurance policies, all those things, like we got all that stuff lined up. Because uh, I'll be forty six next month, and the way I look at finances when I was you know thirty, totally different. Right. Of, you know. So. Yeah. I want to ask you, uh, did, did you have anything else you want to say on that? No, no, that was perfect. Uh, from seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? My parents' relationship, well, my mother and father never married. Okay. So marriage has always been like an experimental thing for me mm. because I didn't come from a family of you know, single-handed married people. And two of my uncles got married and two of my uncles got divorced. So everything I had to learn was trial and error. I wish I had um, more mentor marriages to look up to and to confide in and to, to sit at the helm of and, you know, eat away at, you know, what they could teach us. Um, but I didn't have that, that's not my story. We are making a story for our children. Um, one of the things I did because I always wanted to get married since my mother never got married. Getting divorced was like one of the worst things I ever had to do because I had already set my money, my divorce story up, excuse me, as a child. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was overcompensate with the divorce and let my ex-husband have my son every weekend, which was so bad because then it carved a little hole with us um with all the fun activities all the fun and stuff was going on there and mm -hmm. we were handling all the pressing stuff so mm -hmm. um i don't recommend that yeah. 
but yeah, I didn't have that. I didn't have that money. I didn't have, I didn't have a good money story. I had to learn, and I didn't have a good relationship story. Um, and out of the, my grandmom had 10 grandchildren. I was the first one to go to college. So the fact that black families are still saying that, which is, you know, like to me, like there's like a tent of sadness to it, yeah, yeah. that that is still occurring in America, that some of us are still the first to get that amount of money or have that life experience to teach um, the rest of the family. Yeah. We're not that far removed from you know, <laughs> you know slavery and all those different things right. you know what I'm saying? it's 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 not you know we we basically probably what two generations away maybe from wow. our grandparents my, my you know what cousin saying? just said that yeah. he just said that it was not long ago it's like yeah. if you look at it in the scope of history yeah yeah right yeah. so we you know so we still we still progress and we make great progress but yeah. it's still you know Healthy really marriage is yeah, it's still new. Yeah. Yeah. So, tell me a money story for you. That, I mean, not a money story. Tell me a marriage thing for you that you had within your family. Uh, talking about the question I just asked you. Right. Yeah. For me, uh, and I've told the story before, so some of the uh, listeners and viewers know, but I was birthed out of adultery. Uh, I was a love child. Oh. So my parents, I guess that's what they called it. So my parents never married. Uh, well, my dad was married, <laughs> but, you know, he had, had me and my sister. But it taught me that I, I didn't want that. Because now that I'm older, I'm like, I can see having, now that I'm married and remarried, I can't see having a side piece and trying to have my wife too. Right. with some kids with another woman and i'm thinking because my dad had a stroke before he died and and you know and, and i just say this kind of jokingly but i'm like i get it like you trying to raise two 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 families you know what i'm saying you gotta so now that i'm older i couldn't i can't i can't imagine because my wife and i have two kids together and we have one a piece i have one for my marriage she has a, a child from a previous relationship Right. So it's four total. So I can't imagine having a side chick and having a baby trying to raise that baby too, coming home to my wife. It's my wife and I, we've been married five years now. Okay. I have not figured her out yet. I ain't trying to mess with no other woman. I <laughs> one woman is enough for me. I hear you. It's wow. Enough. You know, it's something that a lot of men did that. I don't know how. I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. So that that happened with me. So in that process, I told myself that I never wanted to have that. I always wanted to. And through that, I always wanted to have a healthy relationship. I always wanted to be with one woman that I can grow and build with. Um, and I think in my first marriage, I think there was some pressure uh, religion wise in the church mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I think there was some pressure in that. So I married at 24, okay. which, you know, young. yeah. And, and some people can make it work because I'm mm -hmm. kind of on both sides of the, of, the, of the ship. I can see the benefits of marrying younger, but I can also see marrying older. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of my story. I married when I was 25. Um, mm -hmm. I just say to me, I always tell my son, I did. I always tell my son, wait until you're 30. You know, I always tell him. Now, I, I don't know if I give that same advice to my daughter because the body is different. Mm -hmm. But um, for manhood, I always tell them, like, you can wait till you're 30. And because I, I really wanted to be a one and done for him, I would want more for him and better for him. And to ask those questions that you, you, that you just don't ask until maybe later in life. So that's um, my whole spin on it. it yeah. And how, so how long were you married in your first marriage? We were married for seven years. I think by the time we divorced, it was closer to eight. Because in the state of New Jersey, it was a year that you had to be on a docket to, to stand for divorce. Mm -hmm. But we had seven years. And um, yeah. Mm, yeah. I was married for almost, just about almost 15. You had a, a marriage? 
I <laughs> yeah. So I remarried at 40. So I always tell people, um, remarriage can be a beautiful thing if you take accountability for your actions and where you went wrong. Um, because if I let bitterness and resentment build in my heart, I wouldn't be married to the woman I have now because I would have been too bitter. Right. You know, because some people, they just scratch marriage. And don't get me wrong, remarriage isn't for everyone. But some people, they know in their heart they still want to love again. Yeah. You know, but they've been hurt so bad that they like, they don't want to take that chance. Well, I mean, we talked about this on a pre-call and I'm just going to bring it up really fast. Yeah. I don't know if it makes the show, but yes, because yeah. when he and I divorced, he remarried with, the, I really think it was like a year, maybe a year and a half. And for me, I've been divorced for over 10 years, well, over 10 years before before I remarried again. And so I at first said, no, I'll never do that again. Um, but then my heart just opened. It's like, there's nothing like a marriage where you can express yourself and relax within the confines of a partner that has you. And there's something about, something about it that is it, just beautiful. This is beautiful. And if I had to forgive myself for my wrongdoings and say, you know what? On this level, you could have done more here. You know, you could have gave more or you could have pulled back more to allow him to, you know, get where he needed to be. Um, so I, I, I love I love marriage. And so I'm like, I, I say I'm never, ever promoting divorce. I'm talking about it because I want you to know you can come back from the ashes but I never promote it. I just want to help those who are going through it. For like you said, the religious regions, if you're holding on to religious baggage, let that go. You know, his grace is sufficient. Press on. Um, and if it's financial, let me show you some financial techniques that can take you right now into your marriage and carry you for the rest of your days. And and let's go, you know, like, yeah. let's go. Let's get yeah. you cleaned up and ready for whatever road you're going to take. Yeah, for sure. And let me ask this one question before we go, because we, we just kicking it now. Why do you think men, and I don't know if we talked about this before, why do you think men remarry faster than women? Because I remarried six months later. <laughs> well, yes, I tell my husband too, because uh, my second husband, like, um, he he was in a marriage. And he remarried really fast afterwards. Um, I think, well, just me, because I'm just a woman talking about, so I didn't, I really didn't talk to him about it in that terms. But for me, I'm wondering if men, even more so than women, like the, that like to have that kinship with someone where they can finally find someone to express themselves and to grow with and to like, like be themselves um, unfiltered, right? And you know, like most times, if you marry a good woman, she got you covered. She's gonna look after you in a way that nobody's gonna look after you. And so I think, I, I know my ex husband used to say that to me, like, I don't like coming home alone. I like just, you know, sitting down to a dinner at, at the table by myself. Like, he liked the companion. So, I mean, that's what I think. What do you think? Cause you yeah. said it. <laughs> yeah, I think the same thing. So I, because I'll get inboxes on some women say he don't he don't want to commit to me. We've been together for three or four years and all these different things. And I'm like, look, if he wants you, he will marry you. Because a lot of men don't but they believe that's why men remarry faster. Because they like, I don't want to be alone. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I know in my situation, because during my separation, you know, I was on my own. She was on her own. And my daughter would come over sometimes. Like, we spend weekends together. But it felt weird coming home to an empty house. Yeah. Like, I was just like, wow. Like, I'm, I'm like, really doing this whole single thing, you know. But I also say, too, that when I met my, when I remade, when I met my wife on Instagram, she was so great of a woman. I wasn't willing to gamble and try to date her for four or five years. And you know what I'm saying? I was right. like, I just really believed that she was the one for me. So uh, I was like, I, I wasn't going to waste any time. You know, and we 12 years apart. I'm 12 years older than her. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So she probably had that, what I talked about, that reverence, that respect that comes just naturally, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, but that's, that's us. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom? Maybe someone is listening. Maybe someone is watching who's going through a divorce and they've listened to this whole podcast and in, in this YouTube uh, video. What advice would you give man or woman? that's going through a divorce right now? Oh, if you're going through it, I always say relax, calm down, hold on, right? Mm-hmm. Try to gather yourself so that you're just not emotionally in anxiety mm-hmm. to the point where you can't think. When it comes to money, I would say, this is the time to get a loose leaf binder or get your you know, all your information on the computer and get these financial statements. You need to know the last three years of what income has been coming through those bank accounts. You need to know what your insurance looks like. You need to know what the retirement accounts or pension plans were. And I would say that for men or women, were there any savings accounts? Do you know all the account numbers? These are some very important things. Do you have the passcodes? You know, if you are, you know, this is for sure about to happen. This is the time to separate yourself and say this portion of the funds, let's split it in half. If it's not, if it's not that deep, it depends because it depends on like, if you got tons of money, you won't want to sit in front of a lawyer, but the sooner you can set up your own accounts, the better. So I don't know if you leave them open, depending on your financial situation, but you definitely want to set up your own. You want to start setting up your own because you're going to need it to get your own house, get your own car or get your own rental. Um, and so you need to have your own checking account, your own savings account, start to peel away. Um, like I said, it depends on the measure of money we're talking. Cause it, if it's up there, you definitely want to go ahead and meet with your financial advisor. You also want to meet with your lawyer, but even none is still, if that is not being touched, you want to open up your own so that you have a new way that you're going to funnel your money. I definitely would say that. Please see me at um, Blush Again Shonda on Instagram um, or Blush Again Shonda on Facebook. On YouTube, I'm Shonda DeShill. Um, Please feel free to stop by, ask me any questions. If I know, I'm going to let you know. And if I don't know, I'm going to research it to the bits to get you the information. I have a heart to see you financially come up and have the lifestyle you always wanted to have. Mm. Well, Brave Arts community, you heard it here. I told you the show was going to be great. Shonda, I want to, uh, first of all, just thank you for being a guest today. I want to acknowledge you for sharing your story, for thank being you. transparent uh, about going through a divorce and starting over financially because we don't have these conversations enough. So thanks for your transparency. Thanks for having enough enough faith to want to help others in this area um, because like I said, it's, it's needed. And uh, I want to acknowledge you also for remarrying for not, <laughs> for not giving up on love and yeah. willing to put yourself back out there again and start fresh, no matter the age. So I want to just acknowledge you for those things. So continue doing what you're doing. I'm uh, honored that you would be a guest on today's show to help those who are listening and watching. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. I'm so glad that, you know, you found me. Thank you so much. Yes, for sure. So that means you have to keep creating content so people can find you. Yes, 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 sir. I certainly will. I mean, I'm going to listen to this over and over and answer these questions too and long form content so that it is there. Mm, Yeah, for sure. Brave Hearts community, you heard it here. Make sure you go connect with Shonda because her content is phenomenal. We need to have more conversations like this, especially in our community. Lord knows we need to hear this more often. (laughs) If you are watching this, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you share this with someone who might be going through a divorce. You never know. So make sure you share that video. And if you're listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts by doing so. That leaves you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free things? So make sure you leave that rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Sean DeShill.
Of Flushing right, and Shonda. Yes. Brave Arts community, take care.